All right, guys, welcome back to our uh, third installment here of COVID Ops. Uh, thank you guys for, for tuning in with these. And uh, so far, we've had some pretty good responses and, and um, some good feedback on these. So we'll keep rolling with them as long as that's the case. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about something that I'm actually uh, pretty adamant about, and that is uh, sport coaches without a strength coach, predominantly at the high school level here. Um, you know, I know this is something that's a, a pervasive problem pretty much nationwide. And, um, you know, you guys are in a tough spot with this. So being on this side of the fence, um, you know, just want to continue to try to put out, you know, as much quality information as we can to try to help optimize your situation. So for today, um, you know, goals of this one, we're going to go through some basics of, of strength and conditioning, um, you know, just kind of getting the 101 type concepts across, um, ass assess movement, you know, looking at uh, different ways to organize and optimize your training. And then a big one, obviously, is going to be safety precautions. But, you know, really what this all boils down to here is turning lemons into lemonade. Um, you're going to have less than ideal situations, um, you know, pretty much across the board and, you know, be expected to make the most of that. So I'll try to do my best here to, to keep multiple populations in mind and, and, you know, varying budgets and accessibility and things like that. But um, I do want to apologize in advance here. Uh, this is this one will be a little bit text heavy on the slides. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it right around that 70 minute mark, but um, might go a little bit over here. Um, again, we just kind of have a lot of basic uh, information to, to cover here. So Let's go ahead and jump in now. Um, some preliminary considerations that we want to look at. Um, you know, like I mentioned, this is an unfortunate situation, um, but it's very common. So I think for those of you who are in this position, um, you know, running your weight rooms, running your conditioning and, and running your training that, you know, aren't technically qualified to do so, um, you're doing a good thing. You're doing a good service for your athletes. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends who, who fall in this category too. So, you know, I think it's important that you just continue to try to do the best you can and, and continue to learn the craft as you can. You know, Google is, is a free resource. Social media is a free resource and, and there's a lot of great stuff on there. You know, for those of you who are doing this a little bit more long term, maybe, maybe looking at some conferences or some, even some certifications for this. Um, but you know, again, the theme kind of being, uh, you know, taking lemons and, and making lemonade. Um, we just have to make the most of time, space, resource, and budget. Speaking of resources, um, there are a ton of great ones out there. This is honestly a short list, um, and I'm sure that uh, you know we can add to this uh, quite significantly. But some of my go-tos, and I'll, I'll make sure to put some of the, these links in the description uh, when we post this. But Altus, Eric Cressy, Mike Boyle, Mike Robertson, Pete Bomarito, Cal Dietz. I mean, these guys are all the ones that you know I learned strength and conditioning from. So um, you know anybody can can take something from these, but these. These are probably who I would say are, you know, kind of the the elitists, so to speak, of, of strength and conditioning as it applies to this. Um, and then some others, um, in addition to that, uh, fascia training systems is, has been my big kick lately. Um, you know, that's Bill Parisi. He's a, a big football guy up in the New Jersey area. The NSC, NSCA governing body of, of strength and conditioning in America, um, you know, they're constantly putting out a ton of great material uh, catering to this population. You know, I would strongly encourage you all to, to at least pick up a cheap anatomy book. Um, you can get them off Amazon for 15, 20 bucks. Um, but, you know, obviously that is an important comp, uh, component to this. And then, uh, you know, some others, obviously, you know, I can't mention this without speaking to Virginia High Performance. Uh, you know, me, Vern, Tim, Hannah, Julie, we all have, um, you know, great content through Instagram and Twitter. Um, Driveline Baseball is a good group. Methodical Movement Systems, uh, my guys over in the U.K., they, they, they just continuously put out brilliant information. P3 Athletics is another good one, and, and Football USA, although they aren't really you know strength and conditioning uh, specific, they, they just have a lot of great content as well. When we're getting started, and you know we're just kind of looking at everything from a 10,000 foot view here, um, you know some of these basic questions are, are sometimes kind of you know skipped over or glossed over because you, you all are you know pigeonholed into trying to focus so much on the exercise side of it or the training side of it. I think it's important first to take some some things into consideration here. So you know how old are your athletes? How long have they been training? Um, how many are on the team? How many are going to be in each group? What's the capacity of the weight room, the training area? What kind of access do you have in terms of space and equipment? 
Um, how frequently are they training? What are the constraints? I know now they're they're putting a lot more dead periods in for um, you know the off season and preseasons and and stuff like that. So you know knowing those dates and and how to work around them. Um, and this is another big one too. You know how many assistant coaches can help? Um, and I don't think that they at all need to be you know just specifically from your team or your department. You know get familiar and friendly with everybody and you know everybody kind of chip in and help do what they can do. Um, I know a lot of high schools will have. Um, you know, select alumni come in and, and kind of help, you know, to at least have hands and eyes, uh, which is really all it boils down to in the weight room um, when they can. So uh, younger athletes, you know, we're going to have less focus on external load, more focus on just movement competency and capacity. Um, you know, when you have more athletes, uh, it's going to be less exercise variance, less com complexity, you know, less sp space is obviously going to equal, you know, less opportunity to use a bunch of different equipment. We got to be a little bit more efficient when we have less space. When we have less equipment access, we have more demand for layers or very simply creativity. Um, you know, sometimes you got to, you got to get crafty with this stuff. Um, less training frequency means we're going to have more of a total body focus every time we get in the weight room. And this is, uh, you know, definitely the most important point on this slide, but probably one of the most important throughout this presentation. Um, I would just recommend a very strict policy of a 10 to one athlete coach ratio and never anything more than that. Um, I know that really complicates things sometimes and, and, you know, makes it hectic for scheduling purposes, but this is a really big one. And honestly, 10 to one is a pretty high ratio. Um, it's just tough to keep your eyes on, on so many athletes. So I would say ideal is closer to five to one. Um, but you know, again, just being strategic and, and resourceful will help with this. But it's important to understand that, you know, your environment is going to dictate a lot of your outcome. And these are the factors that we can have somewhat control over. So, you know, trying to make the most of these is a, a good first step. Rule number one. This goes for sport coaches, strength coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists, doctors, anybody that, you know, works with other humans in a, in a performance or a medical setting. Um, rule number one, do no harm. So no matter what we do, you know, whether it's conditioning, training, skill work, whatever, uh, our goal is to keep athletes healthy. So if we're doing things that are imposing risk or are increasing the likelihood of, of injury occurrence, then, you know, we're already moving in the wrong direction. Um, when you're in these situations, you have to be very mindful of your scope and understand what the boundaries and limitations are. And, you know, that's really a legal thing, uh, you know, without being certified in this. And, you know, you have some kid who goes down from a conditioning session. Um, that's a pretty hefty legal situation you could have on your hands. So, you know, take that very seriously. Um, one thing I mentioned to sport coaches often is ineffective training is better than harmful training. So, if, you know, if we're erring on the side of caution, you know, dare I say, you know, being a zealot about it, um, you know, make compromise or hamper some of the perceived effectiveness of your, your training. But again, 10 out of 10 times, it's, it's better than anything that's going to hurt them. Um, the big thing with the, you know, I think this, I don't mean to be uh, stereotypical here, but I think this one applies more to the football crowd than anybody else. Um, but we, we really just have to kill this mental toughness thing. Um, training is a skill, and, and it's a skill that we're, we're utilizing to improve performance on the court or on the field. Um, you know, the, the whole, we're going to run you till you puke or you know, do, you know, a 20 rep drop set on a leg press until you can't stand. I mean, it's just stupid and it, there's, there's really just no value in it. So, you know, we really got to kind of start to veer away from this. Um, but again, you know, safety is a non-negotiable component and uh, we always need to err on the side of caution with this. Some of these basic safety protocols, you know, uh, looking at, at loading parameters, when we put athletes under load uh, excessively or, you know, a little bit too, too quickly, um, that's when we start to get into the danger zone. Um, you know, kids are growing. Kids are, are, you know, still new to training. Even if they're, they're on the more elite or advanced side of things, they're still very new to this. So in my opinion, I just don't think there's really any room for 1RM testing. Um, you're really just not getting much out of it for the risk that you're putting into it. Um, you know, I think a three RM for a, a bench squat dead is, is perfectly fine. You know, maybe messing around with like a two or three rep clean, 
um, you know, is perfectly fine. But to just really try to push the needle just to get a number on the board is, is, is really nonsensical. So always ask yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, is what we're doing going to be worth it in the long run? So when we're looking at progressing movements, um, we want to look at it in a sequential fashion. You know, in, introduce everything to your athletes with body weight or with an empty bar. Be very thorough with your instruction, and then we'll go to a light load, you know, and let them get some repetition without any risk of injury. And then once they get proficient with the technique, then we'll start to incre incrementally, you know, add some weight to this. Um, but, you know, a good point here, too, is, you know, when when we see a lot of stuff circling the 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 Twitter sphere and, and Instagram world, um, you know, we always see the videos of max squat days or max box jump days or whatever. Um, if you're going to post something, make sure that it, it passes the eye test. You know, you don't want to just basically put your bad reputation out on, on, you know, the internet for everybody to see. So, uh, you know, just be very cautious and mindful with these. Another thing is, uh, you know, there are certain exercises that should and should not be spotted. The ones that are spotted are the closed chain, uh, you know, more conventional type lifts. So bench press, back squat, front squat. You can, you can spot on an overhead press. Um, although, you know, it's really just kind of a guide uh, spot, not really a, a true spot. Um, exercises that are not, do not spot your cleans. That's a major safety risk. Um, if an athlete's going to miss on a clean, they should know how to bail a lift. Um, deadlifts, again, just really no purpose on, on spotting on a deadlift. If they're going to miss, they just drop it. And jerks, you know, these, these Olympic movements, we, we're, we're moving too fast and, and there's too much opportunity for, uh, you know, missing in multiple directions for there to be a spotter. So no spotters on these. Um, spacing and flow, uh, those are big for safety protocols. If we have too many athletes in the weight room, we're already at a safety risk. And if we don't have a good flow of the weight room, you know, we're, we're asking for trouble. So be very mindful there. And then, you know, if your athletes are puking, you're doing something wrong. It's just not the point of this. It's not a punishment thing. It's not a mental toughness thing. This is a skill. Some goals here. Um, you know, at the top here, this is more speaking to the coaches. Uh, your empirical goals in this order are to foster a safe and controlled environment. Um, you know, this is a this is a place, the weight room, the, the you know, conditioning area. The, these are places that athletes should feel not only safe, but that they're a part of something. It's not just this, you know, chaotic, disorganized, um, you know, free for all. We're going to, we're going to really try to make sure that this is a, uh, these are controllable variables. So we're going to make sure we're trying to stay on top of all of those. Um, make training engaging and fun. Uh, this is another one that's a big misconception where we, we see these old school uh, coaches, you know, who in fairness, this is how it was for them coming up. But you know, again, this isn't a punishment or an intimidation thing. We're trying to teach kids. And if we want to teach kids, it needs to be engaging. And, you know, they have to have fun while they're doing it or they're just going to, you know, stop coming. So, um, you know, really putting an emphasis on that. Coming down the list, uh, athletes should feel encouraged, train their best and confident in the instruction. So, again, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is something that should be almost informative for them. So, you know, if they're not getting something out of it or if they don't feel like they're getting better with what they're doing, why should they feel incentivized to return? Um, and then, you know, fourth and the, again, this is in order, you know, the fourth goal of this is to produce tangible results and, and make improvements. Um, the good thing with high school athletes is you really don't have to do too much for them to see results. Um, you know, their bodies are very impressionable, impressionable at that age um, from a physical sense. So, um, you really don't have to do too much. So the, the, the results and the improvements will kind of take care of themselves. You want to put your attention on these three at the top. Some of the expectations here for the athlete side, um, athletes should be on time and attentive. Um, it used to drive me insane as an athlete and, you know, I don't really work in this setting, uh, per se, but you know, with all my athletes, uh, it's the same thing, man. Be on time and, and, and be ready to go. This this is not, you know, an optional thing or this is not a, an additional thing. This is a part of your program. This is a part of your, your process. So treat it no differently than practice. Um, you're here to teach. They're here to learn. Again, if we walk out onto the field or the court, um, you know, and we're bullshitting around and, and not ready to pay attention or, or, you know, talking with our friends, how would you respond to that? Well, it's no different in the weight room, right? And, and again, this is not a disciplinarian thing. This is just a giving it the significance that it deserves thing. 
Um, an athlete should feel part of a group dynamic. So whether it's your best athlete on the team or, or you know, the freshman who you have just met, you know, everybody should feel like they're a part of a cohesive group. Um, everybody's working together. Everybody's working for the same goals and for the same results and for the team. So everyone should feel a part of this. <clears throat> Some basic gym etiquette. Um, you know, I know it's almost silly to even put this slide up here, but you know, again, this is another one that, you know, I think back to my time, you know, lifting as a high school athlete and, uh, these, these were some of the biggest problems that I, that I can recall. So, um, you know, knowing that we're, we're, uh, introducing these things from the start, uh, and setting a clear expectation should go a long way. So, you know, proper footwear, clips, spotters when required, uh, you're racking your weights, you're wiping equipment down, we're deep cleaning every week. Um, and again, being on time and focused and ready to work. So, you know, I think this is a good way to put some onus on your athletes and to um, help them have some buy into the program, you know, putting the responsibility on them that, you know, if the gym isn't cleaned um, on a weekly basis as a team, um, you know, then maybe they don't have the, they haven't earned the right to, to work in there yet. You know, it's a little thing. So putting some onus on them can uh, kind of help to galvanize that that dynamic. Um, and then hygiene, you know, wash hands before entering. I mean, shit, look at what we're in right now with this whole coronavirus thing, I mean, you know, maybe more now than ever, it's important to put some emphasis on this, but, you know, you can't come in looking and smelling like shit and, and, you know, not showered and washed and, you know, just, just be, be mindful and logical of these things. So, you know, body and breath odor, uh, smelly ass shoes, you know, people who sweat excessively, you know, make sure we're, we're wiping down after them, maybe even a little more and, you know, keeping personal space between athletes. Optimizing your space and budget. I know this one is uh, this is going to be very very different based on you know where you're at and what your your situation looks like. Um, but I would I would recommend early and often here you know get get tight with your AD. Uh, get 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 close with the people that can help you and and you know are going to be in your corner on these things. So um, on a broad scale here you know establish what you don't have access to. Um, uh, you know I get a lot of inquiries on these you know, hey, what's a good, what's a good company to buy my exercise equipment from? And, you know, should I get this thing or a velocity tracker, or, you know, all these different pieces of equipment and technology. But um, I think we need to look at the grassroots first and see if we can utilize some minimalist equipment and kind of make the most of it before we make any kind of, you know, big time purchases. So um, getting rid of things that are unnecessary that you know, you're not going to use. And then looking down here, at, you know, some of your bang for your buck equipment, landmine rig, uh, mini bands, bands, sleds, turf, floor space, med balls. I mean, these are all things that are very cheap, um, relatively speaking, I guess. And um, you can just do a lot of things with them. So it's just going to help you in the long run to have access to things that you can utilize uh, in a more versatile sense. So let's jump into some uh, strength and conditioning 101 here. Um, again, this is another one that, you know, I, I had like, I don't know, probably 35 slides on initially and had to kind of dial it back. So there's a ton of basic content that I'm going to miss in this, um, but just to highlight some of the bigger ones that stuck out to me, uh, I think the first thing to understand is uh, knowing that there are different tissues throughout the body, and really is as far as you're concerned, just knowing that um, you know each tissue is going to respond differently to different stimuli. So you know we have the obvious muscles, muscles attached to bone via tendons, um, and they respond best to full load or full range of motion, contractions, under load, <clears throat> tendons, we're thinking bone, bone to muscle, uh, muscle to bone rather, um, tendons respond best to heavy load and movements under velocity, ligaments are bone to bone and respond best to full range of motion, and then fascia is uh, one interwoven sheath throughout the body and it responds best to plyometric and ballistic action. So really your only takeaway on that is, is we have to do some different modalities to get a different effect or response from each of these tissues. And then this is just a nice little illustration here of kind of how it's all interwoven and it's all, you know, kind of together here, but we have a tendon coming off of bone here. It looks like a, a femur here um, that kind of uh, blends into the muscle and then the muscle belly breaks down into all this other stuff that means nothing to you. But again, just know, you know, different tissues respond to different stimuli. Hopefully we're pretty good on these, but the basic contraction types of any given movement, we have the eccentric, isometric, and concentric phase. Um, the eccentric phase is the lowering, 
Isometric is the transition and the concent uh, concentric is the ascent of the movement. Um, when we're cueing these on the centric phase, I'm thinking, uh, you know, manage the load uh, coming down, manage the force. At the isometric phase, we're thinking control or stabilization. And then on the concentric phase, we're always going to think express or finish fast. Some planes of movement here now. So again, another one that um, you know very basic, but we should we should be aware of this. Um, your sagittal movement is your forwards and backwards. So this is spreading, lunging, bench press, push up. Um, this is by far where most uh, pass planes of motion occur. Um, the frontal plane we're thinking left to right, lateral. Uh, so like a slide shuffle, lateral board, um, or a pal off press. Uh, this is commonly a very weak plane for most um, because we spend so much time in the sagittal plane. The muscles that are responsible for for uh, you know moving in the frontal plane are often under trained. Um, the transverse plane it, we're thinking rotational mechanics, so swinging a club, throwing motion, fan cable chop. Um, this also is commonly under trained. Um, we get a lot of indirect work on the transverse plane because it's kind of always going. But um, you know again these are just things that you need to kind of think about um, when we're setting everything up. So a nice image here again. Uh, transverse being the rotational, frontal plane being left to right, sagittal plane being front to back. If we look at some different training modes here, um, you know these are these are kind of a, uh, a a variable thing in themselves, but these are you know probably the most common I, I would imagine. Um, we're looking at you know strength endurance, hypertrophy, muscular strength, strength speed, and then muscular power. What you'll notice here with these, and this is uh, probably the most important part of this, is um, there's a reciprocating trade-off between intensity and volume. So if we're looking at strength endurance, we're thinking low intensity, you know, less than 60%, because we're going to be working higher reps. Um, very rarely will I actually program anything for 15 reps, and in fact, if it's a back squat, bench press, deadlift, uh, we're not we're not going to ever get anything near 10 uh, 15 reps but you know case in point being um, we're thinking 10 12 15s so we're going to obviously have a lower intensity and then when we come down to hypertrophy um, we're thinking you know more that moderate resistance kind of the mid range uh, rep volume higher set volume muscular strength now we're coming into our highest intensities above 80% um, again, kind of moderate to high volume, three to five sets, three to six reps. And then you'll notice here there's another kind of transition point where we now start to work back down. So the, the goal or the emphasis here is to just get in shape, right? It's, it's just to, to be that muscular endurance, strength endurance, uh, kind of exhaustive um, type fatigue. Then we transition into working to increase muscle mass. So we need a little bit heavier weight, a little bit lower volume because of that. Um, and then from getting bigger muscles, we're going to go into making bigger muscles strong. These are going to be our highest intensities, right? So now we're going to transition our focus into more speed emphasis. So uh, is, is simply as it can be stated, uh, moving moderately heavy weights fast. So we're going to start working our percentages back down. But what you'll notice is the sets and reps actually stay on the lower end because again we're starting to focus more on the speed of contraction or the, the velocity of the movement and then we double down again to muscular power where we're going to work even lighter percentages and move them even faster because again we're seeing the sets and reps are pretty much staying the same <clears throat> looking at uh, energy systems here um, three major energy systems that are all working all the time um, they're just working in different capacities so first here we have your ATP PCR um, which is your anaerobic energy system so this is your short burst explosive speed high energy um, but it takes a long time to recover um, so we have you know we're thinking you know high intensity effort or, or we're using heart rate variable but um, you know it's gonna be uh, like a, a 10 second ish time frame, right? Five to 10 seconds um, is what we're looking at here. And you see on the work rest interval, a long, long rest interval. So we're going to actually take three to five times whatever our work set is um, for our rest time here. 
your glycolytic is is kind of that mid range, um, a little bit of blending of the struct or blending of the systems. So we're thinking kind of more in that moderate intensity range, um, and this is going to be from you know 12 to 75 seconds. So as you see, the intensity comes down, as does the rest time. So now instead of a three to five time uh, ratio, we're thinking about a two ratio. So very simply, if we're working for 30 seconds, we're resting for 60 seconds. And lastly, we have the oxidative or aerobic system. This is our low intensity system. So basically anything above 75 seconds. And because it's a low intensity system, we don't need as much for, uh, rest time after our sets. So we're thinking like a one to one ratio. And this is just an uh, image kind of uh, putting that putting that all together. But I think the important thing with high school athletes is, is uh, you know, irrespective of what your sport is, uh, we need to make sure we're touching on all these different energy systems. And again, we'll just, and we're going to get into this obviously, but we're going to change what we're emphasizing um, and how much time we're putting into each. Something that gets talked about all the time, sport specific training. Um, so what is that? What, what, what constitutes sport specific training? Well, the sport planes of moment, uh, movement, right? So we were just looking at, you know, frontal, sagittal and, and transverse planes. This plus sports energy, sport energy system requirements. So the last slide we were looking at with, you know, aerobic, anaerobic, and oxygen, or uh, um, glycolytic rather. Um, and then what are the individual deficits and weaknesses of the athlete? Those three variables right there will create your quote unquote sport specific training, right? Where do the, where do the athletes move when they're playing? What's their work rest ratio like in game and in practice? Where are they deficient and weak? There's our sport specific training. Some of the laws of strength and conditioning. So I touched on this one in uh, the first one of these webinars, um, looking at programming variables. But you know, again, we don't need to get too deep into this one. As far as you need to know, training should be individualized. It should be at a progressive nature where we're going from basic to complex, general to specific. We got to create overload, right? We're going to work our way into it appropriately and, and, you know, incrementally work up to those heavier weights. But at some point, you know, we do need to overload the athletes to create an adaptation. Um, athletes must rest and recover throughout training cycles or they're not going to work. Um, and again, you know, we're going to get into all of these, but um, this is a big one. You know, we, we have to make sure that we're planning rest uh, strategically. Um, gains will be lost if we don't train. That one's pretty straightforward. Uh, training mode should be specific to the population at hand. So again, you know, taking all of these into consideration, all of that is just really a roundabout way of saying that, you know, different things need to be done for different athletes, um, depending on what they do. Fatigue, soreness, and recovery. So uh, a very big one um, at the high school level. Uh, I think before we get into anything on this, it's important that we talk that, you know, we can't misconstrue recovery or rest for being soft or you know, not wanting to work or whatever. And, you know, I know the big thing now is, uh, or whatever, you know, all, no days off grinding, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, if we can, if we can work five, six, seven days a week for, for five, six, seven months uninterrupted, then let me just be honest with you. You're not working hard enough because we haven't demanded recovery. Right. So it, it's not, a, it's not a thing of integrity. It's not, you know, about volition. It's, it's about being strategic. Um, but the better you can recover, the harder you can train. Um, we also can't, you know, confuse uh, recovery and, and, you know, rest modalities for doing nothing at all, right? You know, it's, um, there, there, there should be something, uh, here we are down here, yeah, don't, don't confuse this for nothing. Um, you know, we're thinking mobility, foam rolling, dynamic stretching, you know, low intensity plyometrics, floor work, ground work, you know, rest and recovery doesn't mean you can't do anything. Uh, or you shouldn't do anything. It just means that, you know, we're going to dial back a little bit and change the focus. But um, one thing I did want to touch on here was uh, the lactic acid myth um, that we, you know, always hear about. Um, lactic acid is not directly responsible for muscle soreness. Um, however, a byproduct of lactic acid is hydrogen. When hydrogen is in the presence of water, it swells. And when the uh, muscle belly swells, it presents as muscle soreness. So, What's the best way to reduce that? Get up and move. Um, you know, again, low intensity, light effort, but you know, we, we need to move to buffer that hydrogen out and kind of get everything circulating again so that we can 
um, start to return back to normal. Along similar lines here, um, discomfort, pain, and injury. Uh, it's important that we're, we're very clear on these and, and we understand that, you know, where discomfort is desired in training, um, pain and injury absolutely are not. Um, so being able to discern with your athletes, and I know, you know, with 14, 15, 16 year olds, this can, this can be a little bit tricky, um, but being able to discern what is discomfort <coughs> and what is pain and how to kind of monitor those. Um, so we, you know, we should encourage athletes to push through, um, some discomfort, um, you know, but not mandated, uh, but discomfort is going to drive a positive training adaptation. And again, you know, we, we always want to look for that positive training adaptation <coughs> with pain. <clears throat> we should approach with caution. Um, you know, I work exclusively with adults, but I think to a certain extent it would go the same for young athletes, but we should approach them not only with caution, but what is their input? What are they telling us? Are they, are they telling us that they don't feel right, that something, you know, definitely doesn't feel like they can keep going? Um, take their word for what it's worth. And, and with all of this stuff, as always, you're going to err on the side of caution. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a numbers game. So if somebody tells you they don't feel right or they need to get something looked at, even if you think they're faking or, or kind of, you know, just babying it, listen to them, let them, let them, you know, let them get the, the attention and, and the, the, uh, medical oversight that they need. So find your, your athletic trainer, or, you know, if you have a team physician, like utilize these people and then injuries, uh, much more cut and dry, but, uh, you know, you're not handling any injuries. Um, you know, we, we just immediately refer them to whoever they need to see, but there's absolutely no pushing through. If you see kids, you know, during conditioning tests who, get the pale clammy skin, if their eyes or pupils start to dilate, um, they, God forbid, they get tremors or, or start to, uh, you know, kind of duck over, um, like they're getting ready to go down. You, you don't think about anything other than going to find the appropriate medical staff. And if it does seem to be something that's a, you know, uh, a serious situation, uh, contact 911 immediately. O always better safe than sorry on that. Let's jump now into uh, analyzing or in, and assessing some movement. So I had a little bit of difficulty putting this section together, to be honest. Um, this is just a tough one because it's so dependent on so many variables, how many kids you have, how much time you have, how familiar you are with them, um, what type, type of uh, equipment or, uh, you know, diagnostic tools you have access to. But uh, to just kind of try to general, general sweep this here, um, there's really no right or wrong. Um, you know, within obvious reason, but just think in terms of practicality and, and time efficiency and make sure it makes sense to you. You know, I, I, again, I get inquiries from time to time about, you know, what do you think about this system? What do you think about that system? Well, I think they're great if you know how to utilize them and you know how to implement them, but if you don't, then it's, it's no better than having no plan. So, um, making sure it makes sense to you and your staff. And then, you know, from there measurable and meaningful, you know, it, we don't want to just have a bunch of numbers and intake measures just for the sake of having them. You know, what are we looking at? What are we expecting the athletes to do? Let's look at, you know, just a few variables that we can isolate and, and, you know, actually analyze. Um, current physicals, if, if I'm running a high school weight room, it's, it's 100% mandated that you're going to need a physical before you can set foot in there. That's just my opinion. Um, but I would strongly encourage that. And then where you need it, uh, make sure you get your formal, your formal, cl uh, clearance. Um, so any athletes with any kind of preexisting medical conditions, anybody that's coming off of a specific injury, um, you need that paperwork or they cannot train. And that is again for you, for your well being more than anything else. Uh, CYA always cover your ass. Um, health history forms. This is another one where, um, I just want to know this information with my athletes if I'm working with them. So, um, any kind of, you know, medications, I know, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, the folk, uh, you know, attention medications are, are very common at the high school level, you know, these days. So just knowing if, you know, there's any contraindicating, uh, side effects of those. And, and we just want to try to be, uh, you know, early and, and ahead of the game on those. Um, and then just getting a general health and wellness screening. This is something else that, you know, gets overlooked a lot, but you know, how many hours a night are your athletes sleeping? What time are they going to bed? Or are they playing, you know, PS4 and Xbox or whatever until one in the morning and then rolling into a 6 a.m. lift? Because that's not going to work very well. Um, what does their stress profile look like? Uh, you know, I know we're not counselors and, and, you know, of course, you know, keeping scope and, and, you know, respectability in mind here. But, you know, what does their home life look like? What does their relationship look like? Um, you know, it's uh, people often forget that, um, you know, for a 40 year old getting fired, uh, from work, you know, out of the blue, it's the same 
type of stress effect or the same relative stressor for a 15 year old to, you know, get dumped by his first girlfriend or for her to get dumped by her first boyfriend. So, you know, the, the stress management is a key part as well. And, and I think for the high school level, uh, you know, these, this is a good way to get uh, some indication on behavior as well. But, you know, lastly here, nutrition panel, again, this is another one we don't have a lot of control over, but it's just better to know when you can. So this is a very basic template, um, you know, that you can, you can utilize something similar to this where, you know, we just want to look at what are some three, you know, basic tangible training goals that we want to try to address, you know, throughout the off season or, or whatever it may be. Um, looking over here, you know, what's their training history. It's, it, it's going to be a little bit different for somebody who has, you know, less than six months of training history versus somebody who has two to three years. Um, we always want to be mindful of where their current season is. And then down here, you know, this is something where, you know, I would just note like, you know, concussion last season, um, you know, separated shoulder freshman year, uh, meniscus tear senior year, you know, these are just very basic points that we want to have um, reference to. And then any kind of notes that are going to either, uh, you know, be attached to these injury sites over here, or again, you know, um, specific medications or, you know, hey, he's, you know, saying he's only sleeping, you know, four to five hours a night, like any big points that we want to be mindful of. Um, but with all of that being said, um, you know, this is not an indictment. Uh, we're just looking for, um, you know, really where they are and much less of what they can't do. Um, and we're not trying to find anything. Just let them show you where they're at. Um, we've touched on these, but, um, you know, it's just getting a, a, a feel for where they're at. We're not trying to diagnose or, or indict anybody for anything. So some, some common examples here that we can, uh, and again, I just tried to shotgun approach this, you know, for people with no access to anything and then, you know, kind of in between. So, um, you know, we want to know where basic, our basic anthropometric, anthropometrics, um, height, weight, any glaring abnormalities. Um, we want to look at joint motion. So something like a back to wall overhead flexion um, or, you know, standing against the wall and, and raising your, your arms to the wall with your thumbs back. Um, you know, to look at how the shoulders move, uh, an active straight leg raise. So that's when you're down on your, your back on the ground and, you know, you would just elevate one leg up to try to assess hamstring, hip, uh, hamstring flexibility or hip mobility. Um, and then, you know, looking at half kneel dorsiflexion. So how the ankles move. Um, and then I want to look at global motor control. So, you know, a, a multi-directional bear crawl, a forward reverse lunge, single leg opposite toe touch. The, the criteria here don't, matter nearly as much as is the process of it so don't get too tied up in in what the uh the specifics are at least out of the gate um and well speaking of gate um so you know like a gate cycle analysis is another one that's a really common and easy thing to do where you know we want to try to get athletes out of our shoes for this if we can and um you know try to get a natural uh, natural observation of just how they walk how they move it'll tell us about you know kind of their movement profile and um, you know, so looking at arm swing, are the hands crossing the midline? Are they guarding a shoulder? Um, do they have an arm swing? Or you know, a common thing for again football guys is you know the, that that strong internal rotation of the hand where the thumb is basically pointing to the pockets. You know, and their shoulders are all rolled forward. Um, you know, hips are they kicking out side to side? Is there a difference in hip height? <coughs> do they have that uh, you know that stripper booty posture where their 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 butts you know pushing up and back and away and um, you know, or they kind of tucked underneath with that posterior tilt. Um, and then looking at the feet and the knees, is there any kind of pronation or the, are the knees coming together? Do we have a lot of, you know, foot rolling in when we're stepping? So, you know, again, this isn't something that you need to think about as like a science project. We just want to, again, get an idea of where they're at with things. And, you know, kind of uh, <clears throat> putting that all together, you know, um, we just want to consider doing our due diligence, right? You think something's problematic, take it to your athletic training staff. Never guess. Um, we want to take good notes and, and remember that this isn't a one-time thing. We're gonna we're gonna circle back to this and we wanna, you know, see if we're making any tangible improvements. Um, and don't confuse an assessment for baseline testing. You know, you guys are all pretty proficient over here. You're you're good with this stuff. We wanna make sure we delineate for from the uh, baseline testing for our assessment because each has its purpose. Um, so assessment is, is seeing, you know, the safety risk and, and, you know, the preventative measures. This is looking at their performance. So mitigating risk in the weight room. Um, if it looks like shit, it is shit. Um, be intuitive. 
you know, again, without being, you know, you know, highly trained or, you know, uh, educated on these, these things, you don't need to know anything really beyond that. If it looks like it's wrong, it's probably not right. So um, we just want to emphasize quality over quantity in every aspect, every time. Uh, doing otherwise is setting that up, setting, doing that otherwise is setting that up, setting them up to fail. So, um, you know, really just trying to put them in the best position that we can. Um, when we're introducing our primary lift, so our bench press, back squat, deadlift, um, you know, again, we want to make sure we're doing it with an empty barbell or body weight first. We want to try to have a, a coach or, or somebody overseeing the weight room, uh, you know, individually check off each athlete that, you know, hey, they at least, if nothing else, have the basic fundamentals to this and they can do these foundational movements. We'll see about loading it, but hey, they can do it, they're safe. Um, and then, you know, kind of at the same time, we want to teach the athletes how to, how to spot correctly, um, you know, where to stand, what to expect, what to look for, and things like that. Um, but increased weight is always earned, period. Um, you'll, you'll load them up when they show you they're ready to be loaded up. Um, small increments, big return is something I live by. Um, you know, when we, when we increase with, with smaller load, um, I think there's a big return on confidence and I think that the, it, it really helps to retain the, the technique. So, uh, small increments on our, our load parameters, um, and it should never compromise our form. So, uh, we'll look at a couple of, uh, major movers here and, and I got to apologize. I wanted to do videos for these, but I suck at this technical stuff. So, um, you just get some old school, uh, pictures that I had to pull off of Google. So, um, when we're looking at the, the squat, uh, this is demonstrating uh, the difference between a low bar and a high bar back squat. But what I want to address with this is just more so the chest position, right? So we see with the low bar back squat, we get more of that forward trunk lean, whereas with a high bar, we're going to sit uh, kind of more upright or vertical, right? Um, so the, the point that, that I want to illustrate with that with you is uh, both are okay, you know, but if we see that forward trunk lean, where the hips are shooting up and behind, right, and we're losing this angle here, and you know the eyes and the chest dump forward, that's obviously not a good position to be in. So, understanding that the angles should all be related, you know, and we should see some continuity between foot, knee, knee, hip, hip, shoulder, or torso or trunk. Um, as long as this looks like it's a one collective unit, um, the angle of the chest, the depth of the hips. Um, the shifting of the knees over the toes, uh, those things are all perfectly fine as long as the collective whole looks together. But, you know, using the knees as the example, that's a common one where people freak out about knees going over toes. Show me any athletic event where the knees don't go past the toes. Um, and that, that in no way, shape, or form is a bad thing. However, if we're at the top of the squat and the knees shoot forward over the toe, um, and, you know, certainly if we see the heel pulling up off the ground, that's problematic. We do not want the knees shooting over the toes as the first movement, right? We descend back into the hips, and then as we descend down into the bottom of the squat, if a byproduct of that is the knees pushing past the toes, that's perfectly fine and actually a good demonstration of fixed dorsiflexion. So um, knowing your principles on, on the relationships is, is really the most important part here. This is a terrible picture, but honestly, it was the best one I could find. Um, but with bench press, what we're looking at, um, you know, obviously our five points of contact, right? Left foot, right foot, hips, upper back, head. Um, what I'm going to drive with the athletes on bench press is this is a total body exercise. This is not a chest tricep exercise. Um, in fact, if we are not um, feeling this in our lats, if we're not getting some residual soreness in lats after uh, bench days, uh, we're, we're doing something wrong. So, do not think of this as just a chest tricep exercise. We want to recruit everything that we can um, for pressing. So I am driving my feet down, driving my knees out, and flexing my glutes as hard as I can um, to create, uh, you know, posterior and and uh, down the chain stability. Right? You know, getting drive from the feet, getting drive from the glutes, all contributing to here. Um, the back arching off the bench is is okay. We don't want it to be excessive, and it should not be like a conscious, like deliberate thing. But if we get some separation at the low back, that's fine, as long as the hips or the glutes don't come off the bench. When we start to see that push off the bench, we're, we're doing something wrong. 
Um, when we're looking at the arm position or the elbow position, I always like to think softball distance between elbow and ribs, um, or you can more succinctly say that is 45 degrees from the body. Um, but we want to think about crushing a grapefruit in our armpit um, as we're pressing away from the body. So that's going to help to kick those lats on. And if you think about when athletes miss on a bench press, what happens most, most commonly, right? The elbows flare out and away from the body and the bar bows back into the J hooks, right? Those are both indications that the lats are not doing what they're supposed to do. <coughs> um, shit, probably even a worse picture here. Um, the, uh, the deadlift angles are going to be similar to the back squat angles. Um, personally, if I'm deadlifting football players or any athlete really for that matter, um, I'm just not going to pull from the floor. I want to elevate the bar when I can, I did, or even better using a, a hex bar or a trap bar in, in lieu of a, a straight bar. I just think it's better for athletes. Um, and we'll kind of leave it at that for now. But, um, you know, if you are using a straight bar and if you are pulling from the floor, Again, just look at the relationship between the trunk and the hips, the hips and the knees, the knees and the ankles. Um, you know, we want to try to have, uh, you know, everything move in unison rather than like that, you know, beach chair unfolding pattern where we, you know, whip the bar off the ground with the back and then kind of stand up from there. This should be a conscious pushing the ground away. And as the hip and knee extends, the trunk starts to rise uh, in accordance with that. And that's kind of demonstrated here, I guess. Um, but anyhow, to that end, you know, no rounding in the low back. Don't let the low back blow, blow away from the body. Um, we're not looking up. We're making a, a double chin here to keep a neutral neck. Um, we never want to deliberately look up or down. The head should move with the body. If my chest is down, my eyes are down. If my chest is up, my eyes are up. So, um, the other thing with the deadlift too, uh, you know, if we're going to go over 85, 90% on a deadlift or a back squat for that matter, um, I want to see a belt on. So, um, I would avoid heavy, heavy load, uh, if we don't have a belt. And lastly here, um, again, another shitty picture, uh, looking at, uh, you know, kind of the leg action of a sprint. Uh, the, the difficulty with sprinting is there is there are literally thousands of, of different schools of thought on this um and you know i think we're kind of getting to the point now as a, a strength uh community um to where there really isn't technique per se for sprinting it's just kind of optimizing what the athlete shows you um but you know to keep it simple here um i just want to see you know, chest and eyes in a good position with the arms. I'm thinking, you know, eye socket, hip pocket, driving through the elbow. Um, we don't want to reach or, or cross the midline too much and, and get that, you know, trunk rotation. Um, just very inefficient from an energetic standpoint. Um, with the leg action, we're thinking pistons. We're thinking driving down and back, um, attack the ground, think down and back. Um, and, you know, I mean, even on this this image, uh, illustration here, you know, this this uh, swing leg here um, is uh, almost like a butt kick pattern, right? You know, we don't really want to see that. We want to see that leg more about here um, rather than that heel coming up to the ass cheek. So, you know, again, I don't, I don't mean to get overly technical, but um, with sprinting, you know, if it looks atrocious, uh, it probably is atrocious. So, you know, sometimes some things that you can do to, to kind of quick fix that are to film them, let them see themselves and, you know, pointing out one or two big variables and try to get them to focus on just that. And then when they correct that, then go to the next one and, you know, kind of, you know, just piece it together. Don't, don't throw a million different things at them. Making good time here, I think. So, um, now we're going to get into the, the bulk of this. So organizing your calendar, this is uh, really where it all starts, right? We have three pri primary seasons, uh, you know, ir irrespective of sport. Um, in the off season, we're thinking grow. This is our time. This is really where we're going to get the bulk of our training in. We're going to have the most time and opportunity to get our training in. Um, so this is going to be, you know, high intensity, high volume. We're going to, we're going to get after it in the off season. The preseason is the refinery period, and ironically, this is where most people start to throw in their their testing, um, which is 
just really dumb. Um, your preseason period is, is where we should feel the freshest that we'll, we're going to feel all year. Um, we're ready to go. Nobody cares how much we can want our end back squat if we can't play on Friday night. So your preseason period should be thinking nothing more than just getting ready for the season. And then in season, it's just a, it's really just kind of keep yourself afloat maintenance, you know, whatever we can do to, to try to, uh, mitigate, uh, diminishing returns is what we're going to do. Um, so, you know, looking at this a little bit more technically here, um, in our off season, uh, we're going to have high variability across the board, right? If we're training for 12 to 16 weeks, we are not going to have high intensity and high volume for 12 to 16 weeks. These are all, you know, going to shift and, and, uh, you know, undulate as we go along. But, um, you know, our thinking is grow, uh, getting, getting in shape to train, building muscle mass, increasing strength and increasing power. It's, it's pretty conventional. Um, with preseason work, uh, you know, again, we're thinking refinery, light loads, low to moderate volume, um, really just trying to emphasize speed and power in season. Again, it's long, it's grueling, um, depends on your, your sport. It depends on how good your team is. It depends on, you know, what state you're in. So, you know, the length of the season is going to be highly variable. Um, but again, we're thinking never really anything more than an 80% and, and our reps are going to be very low. Our sets are going to be very low, irrespective of what we're doing. Um, but I can take this a step further with the in season and just say, whatever the hell you can do, um, you know, the, the time, uh, to train the, the ability to train or eligibility to train is going to be very low. It's going to be very complicated and hectic. So just trying to get the most out of what we can. Um, looking back at off season, uh, our, our major goals here, we're going to try to take full advantage of the time, uh, improve our, our general fitness, uh, muscular size, strength, speed, RFD, rate of force development, that is, um, power. And I also think this is an important time to discuss informative items such as sleep, nutrition, hydration, stress, you know, we have a million different things going on in the mind of any high school in the country. So, you know, when we uh, have in-season work and when we have school going on, we have our sports season going on, um, it's not a good time to dump a bunch of shit on them about sleep importance or nutrition or hydration. You know, they're just not going to think about it or, or be able to register it. So being timely with these things is another part of it that, that really goes a long way. Um, you know, so if we break down an off-season here, um, and this is really just for any sport, there's, this isn't anything specific, but... Um, the first couple weeks here, weeks one to week, uh, three, um, you know, we're thinking GPP or general physical preparation. So again, that's a fancy way of just saying organized play. Um, we don't have anything specific on intensity, nothing specific on volume. Um, you know, rest time's variable, but this is no agenda. Um, you know, good time for games, good time for, uh, you know, some, some light level competition between the team. <coughs> um, but again, just letting them kind of, uh, you know, rejuvenate and recover. Then we get into the bulk work. So our accumulation and our transmutation phases here, which, uh, you know, those words specifically don't mean anything to you. But um, basically, this is going to be the bulk of our training, right? Four to six weeks, we're going to get in shape, get big muscles. Four to six weeks, we're going to make big muscles strong. Um, you know, and these are going to be the grueling uh, phases of training. So this is where, you know, athletes are going to be sore. They're going to be tired. It's going to be exhaustive. Um, but we want, you know, a, a moderate intensity in our accumulation. So we're thinking that 60 to 80% range, um, you know, pretty high volume here, right? Uh, volume is, is what drives adaptation in this phase. Um, you know, coming down to transmutation, uh, you know, this is going to be our highest intensity phase over 80%. Um, and our reps are going to be low because of that. And this is where we're really trying to push the needle. Um, the realization phase, so this is basically coming into your preseason. Now we're going to focus back on making strong muscles fast. So lower intensities, as we've already mentioned, and keeping those the volume low on those as well um, because we want to feel fresh, fast, and fatigue resistant. Our preseason goals, do not get anyone injured. And this is why I'm really, really adamant when I say don't do your testing in preseason. Um, I, I know the psychology behind it. I've been an athlete. I know a lot of, you know, sport coaches and I get it. I do. But from a, a biological uh, perspective on this, it's really inefficient. It's in, in, and you're really just kind of asking for trouble. So, you know, we want to wrap up our testing, you know, kind of at the end of this phase here, right? So that gives us an additional two to three weeks before we even get to the preseason, right? But again, you, you do not have to back squat on a baseball field. You do not have to bench press on a football field. We don't care how much these athletes can do if they can't play. So get your testing done earlier. 
Um, our emphasis is on lighter weights and higher velocity. We want refined power and skill movements, low volume to mitigate soreness. We are keeping the goal the goal. Um, so with a preseason overview, we're thinking two to three weeks of uh, you know strength speed, so moving semi-heavy weights as fast as we can. You know, we see that same reflective 60 to 80 percent and that same reflective low um, to moderate here, you know, uh, set rep count. Um, but we're entering the peaking phase. Last uh, little stretch here in the preseason, two to three weeks, move fast, feel fresh. It's very simple. We want to bring our training frequency down. We want to put more skill work in. Um, we want to keep them fresh, keep them confident, keep them healthy. Um, so we want low intensities here low to moderate volume, uh, you know, two to three sets, two to four reps, um, and let them peak, let them move fast. Um, and I, I like to think of it as, you know, the speed of movement should begin to mirror the speed of competition. Um, we're obviously not going to get, you know, quite that moving that quite that fast, but that's kind of the mindset or the goal there. <clears throat> when we bring it down to in season here, again, do not get anyone injured. Um, we're not chasing PRs when we're in season. The goal is to win games so that we can win championships. Um, it's not to be a you know all-time great lifter. So we will have very selective high-intensity days. Um, you know, over the course of ten to twelve weeks, maybe two or three high-intensity days. Um, our emphasis is on maintenance and movement and low volume to mitigate soreness. Um, you know, so for here. Uh, you know, there's no specific mesocycle. It, it, there are just too many variables here to, to really, um, you know, tie it up and make it look pretty. But, you know, anywhere from six to 12 weeks, you know, shit in some cases longer there. Um, but we're just trying to make the most of what we have. And maybe that's just, you know, if we're, you know, looking at a football team, maybe that's just, uh, you know, one lift a week, uh, Saturday mornings after film. Um, you know, we're just kind of doing like a total body circuit thing with, with, you know, some light aerobic or light plyometrics at the end. Um, we want, you know, moderate to, to low really. Um, and you know, same thing, moderate to low. All we're trying to do here is preserve the athlete. So we want to mitigate physical deterioration. Um, you know, if we see athletes who are, you know, dropping 10 to 15 pounds throughout the course of a season, or, you know, they just start to look more and more banged up as the season goes along. Um, our goal is to just give them enough to reduce that effect. And that's it. You know, nobody's going to get stronger in season. Now, if we uh, shift gears here a little bit uh, to wrap this section up, um, looking at some conditioning overviews, you know, we talked about our energy systems, but, um, you know, your aerobic phase is really just going to kind of be reserved for early off season, right? You know, with a, with aerobic training, um, once you get in shape, you don't really have to do a lot to maintain that shape. So, our, our goal here is to get them in shape very early in the off season and then utilize that as we ride throughout the, uh, the rest of the calendar year. Um, but again, we've already touched on, you know, lower intensity, moderate volume, um, and, and low rest, um, on the aerobic side. Um, anaerobic, you know, now we're thinking more of the late off season through in season. Um, so this is, you know, reflective of most sport athletes. Um, we're going to be pretty much, uh, you know, predominantly anaerobic. So this is our higher intensity, moderate to higher volume, and much longer rest time is needed here. So, um, you know, the combination, we can kind of just call this like a lactate threshold type of deal. Um, you know, we're just kind of going as needed. So this is another one that's variable um, kind of as we go along here. But big point on the intensity with these, uh, you know, you can use them off of heart rate values. I can't imagine that being practical for very many high school coaches. So honestly, and this is what I do with my athletes, even, even with access to some of these other, you know, uh, things that we can measure. Um, I'm just using it as arbitrary effort. You know, when we're doing aerobic work. I don't, I don't want you to be, um, you know, hunched over on your knees, you know, ready to vomit. Um, we, we should be, you know, a little bit more fluent in the aerobic phase, whereas on the anaerobic side, you know, um, I want you to just subjectively go, you know, 100% or 90% or, you know, whatever, um, but don't get too wrapped up in that. <clears throat> Structuring your training. So this is, uh, you know, now we're kind of where most of you uh, probably feel lost on what you're doing. So 
hopefully I've broken this up well for you, but we're looking at, um, you know, warm up and movement prep first and foremost. Our block one stuff is going to be, you know, speed, agility, plyos, reactives, um, block two, primary lifts, block three, compound accessories, block four, isolated accessories. So there are two different ways to look at this. One is a, a totem pole or a hierarchy, hierarchy of importance, right? So if I do, you know, if I get cut off halfway through my workout and I'm not able to do anything but these first two blocks, I got exactly what I needed. I just missed on what I wanted. The other way to look at this is, um, you know, order of, of uh, nervous system involvement. So, you know, the first block here, your speed, your agility, your plyos, your act, that is all central nervous system, right? So we want to try to utilize uh, the CNS being fresh right out of the gate. Similarly here, you know, bench, hang clean, back squat, those are heavy CNS exercises. So, you know, before that, uh, that energy system or before the nervous system starts to, to fatigue, we want to make sure we get those two in. And then, you know, kind of rounding it out from there, that's where we get into our accessory stuff. But let's break these down a little bit more. Um, you know, the warm up is your opportunity to set the goal for the day or set the tone for the day. Um, this is not a mindless activity. So the basics are, you know, just increasing body temperature, heart rate flow, uh, stimulating nervous system and muscles. And we want to facilitate the workout. So whatever we're doing for the warm up should be prepping the athletes for the workout. Um, you know, but it's just five to 10 minutes, couple, you know, couple of movements doesn't need to be anything crazy two to four. Um, but again, they should mimic the primary lifts for the, or demands for that day. Um, so if we're doing a bench press, we should have something specific to facilitate a bench press. If we're doing a back squat. We should have something to facilitate a back squat. Um, some of the components, you know, we're thinking locomotion, some band walks, light interval runs, lunging, uh, you know, going into from there dynamic movements, you know, so walking toe touch, lateral lunge, uh, a skips. And then, you know, rounding out with jump rope, light agilities, bridges, crawling, plyometrics. So again, you know, basic, less basic, less basic, or, you know, no CNS, a little bit of CNS, a lot of CNS. Um, but the specific movements and the exercises are much, much, much less important than the tone, the temperature, and the flow. You know, we, we need to have music rock and we need to be, you know, uh, you know talking and, and collaborating and, I, you know, obviously without interfering with the, you know, constructs of the workout, but... You know, we're not at we're not at boot camp for basic training. You know, guys should be girls should be having fun. You know, going through the warm up, getting themselves in the right mindset to train. Um, so if we just look at a very basic sample here, um, you know, using football and basketball here, uh, you know, kind of like a group dynamic stretch, right? So you know, walking toe touch, lateral lunge, karaoke, a skip, b skip. You know, for basketball, tiptoe with overhead reach, <coughs> lateral lunge. Pogo hops, power skips, about five minutes here, you know, in and out. And then we come down here, um, you know, some core activation, some planks, front, left, right, bird dogs, dot drill, agility work. And then on the basketball side, you know, maybe a little bit more of a plyometric emphasis. So some stiff legged box jumps, backboard touches, lateral hops. Um, you know, your movement selection isn't, again, the important factor. Um, it's just the, the way in which we're going about these and, and how the energy is while we're going through them. Um, when we get to block one, uh, you know, we, we already kind of touched on these here, but, you know, athletes should feel fresh. Uh, reps should be sharp and clean. This is a skill. It's not exhaustive. So um, when we come down here, you know, we're thinking 10 to 20 minutes and 20 really being a high end there. Um, two to four movements again, and the movement should be sequenced. So what I mean by sequence is, is we should build into it and then build out of it, right? We're not just going to jump right into it carry that all the way across and then get out of it. Uh, one of the best things I've ever, you know, heard is, you know, like when, when we finish the warm up and we start the workout, we, the athlete shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. Uh, and I think the same kind of goes here for our block one. Like we, we should just roll right into it, building our way up and then get to our high intensity mark and then start to kind of work our way back down before we get into block two. So, you know, some examples here again, just sticking with football and basketball. Um, you know, some falling starts, 10 yard accelerations, some, some flyers, 20 to 40 yards, and then partner runs, you know, linear mirror. So, um, on the basketball side, backward touches, linear bounce sequence. Again, the, the exercises don't matter. Um, well, I shouldn't say it that way, but you know, the exercise selection is the, the less important part of this. You know, you're going to utilize what you know, you're going to utilize what you have. <clears throat> then we get into our kind of our, uh, our big lifts for the day. So, um, you know, again, 
starting with an empty barbell. Even though we got warm, you know, from our block one, you know, acceleration work and our jumps, doesn't mean that we jump right into a, you know, 225 bench press or, or 315 back squat, right? We very smoothly work in with an empty barbell, start start loading up incrementally, and then we start getting to our working sets. So the, the goals here, maximize the time block, but it should never be rushed. Uh, quality over quantity on, always. So if, you know, if we have a 20 minute time block and, you know, a couple athletes get three or four sets and then a couple athletes get two or three sets and then you have a couple that get five, that's great. Um, doesn't really matter. We just want to make sure they're not rushing. Um, so, you know, again, 10 to 20 minutes, this is just going to be one to two movements and we should pair these logically. So when we're pairing a primary lift, um, you know, a bench back, a bench or a back squat or a deadlift or a clean, um, we want to pair it with something that is non-fatiguing, non-competing. Uh, the goal is to stimulate or potentiate the primary lift of that day. So, you know, uh, for football, some back squat, hex bar deadlift, that potentiating effect, um, kettlebell swing, uh, you know, over here, push press, and then coming down, uh, GHD or glute ham development and, uh, some pull-ups. So now we get to our accessory work. Um, this is where we can grip and go, right? So now we're ready to roll. We don't need to have warm up sets, you know, for a bent row or for a, a, a step up, right? So, um, now we're kind of starting to shift our mindset to work capacity. We've done our skill you know, sprint work, our agility work, our jumps, we've done our skill, you know, uh, primary lift, our bench, our clean, our dead, or, or our squat. Not that we're, you know, these aren't important or whatever, but, you know, again, being logical, uh, we should already be uh, pretty good with, you know, some of these more simple exercises. So, um, and then actually, you know, again, that, that being a point, we want to make these exercises more simple, um, you know, and more multi-joint. So there isn't a lot of thinking for the athlete because again, our emphasis is capacity here. So um, we're going to bring down the time blocks. We don't need to spend as much time on these. Um, this could honestly even just be more like 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and we don't want to overload it with a whole bunch of different variations. So two to four movements is perfectly fine. Doesn't really matter how we group them. Depends on a lot of variables. So, you know, just a couple common ones here. Landmine press, split squat, uh, rear foot elevated split squat, single leg RDL, weighted inverted row, band face pull. So, you know, again, just very common things that, that, that don't take a lot of thought. <clears throat> Last one here, uh, you know, the isolated block. So this is one that, you know, if we have the luxury for it, great. If not, no biggie. Um, but this, you know, can be supplemented for conditioning or flexibility, mobility, or, or a number of other things, just depending on whatever the time of the year is. Um, but the athlete should think empty the tank, right? We're just going, we're, we're hammering, we're going to work. Um, so again, they should be simple exercise selection. So you know, we're thinking five to 10 minutes, two to four movements. <clears throat> and it's going to be items like skull crushers, shoulder flies, bicep curls, triceps, seated calf raise. So, you know, very simple stuff. And we're just going to kind of, you know, finish them out there. So, uh, damn, I did good on time on this. Um, if we boil this all down here, um, you know, and kind of look at our big points on this, if we do nothing else, right, we just want to do these three things here. Keep them safe. Nothing else matters. Um, you know, again, it's uh, it's a huge, huge liability. It, you know, and I, I, like I mentioned, you guys are, are doing the right thing and doing what you can, but it's just an enormous liability to have kids in a weight room without having certification for it. Um, so you really just need to err on the side of caution with this. Um, and just continue to ask yourself, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? <clears throat> Second from there, training should be fun and engaging. Um, this is not a belittling thing. This is not a degrading thing. Um, you know, not to get like deep or, you know, anything on the shit like this, but, um, you know, me being, you know, a six foot three, 150 pound junior in high school, um, and just getting absolutely mauled for that, um, put me you know, led me to the weight room. And then, you know, now obviously here I am 15 years later, um, building a career off of it. So it, this should be a place that, that athletes are not only welcome, but they feel engaged. They feel like they're getting something out of it. They feel like their, their, their presence there is purposeful. Um, you know, so an easy way to, to wrap that one up is, um, you know, something that, uh, Vernon always talks with, you know, you know, his kids about, um, be the coach you needed at 15. Um, you know, think back and especially from, 
you know, everybody my age and, and up, you know, we didn't really have a, a lot of, uh, you know, great experiences with, with sport and exercise coming up, you know, and some, some of that old school shit is finally starting to be devolved out, but just be the coach you needed and, and really see this as a, a, an engaging and a, and a kind of a, a cohesive thing with you and the athletes. Um, and then, you know, the final big point there, keeping the goal, the goal, uh, you know, and I'm saying this as a strength coach, uh, we're just using training as a means to improve performance. That, that's it. Uh, you know, I, I do not care how much you can bench, how much you can squat, what you can clean, you know, it, 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 that's all great and, and whatnot. And it's, it's impressive when, when athletes have big numbers there, but can you play? Uh, that's really all it boils down to. So we're just using this as a medium to improve performance and we need to make sure we're clear on that. Assessment and risk assumption, kind of some big three points here. Um, you know, physicals where we need them, medical clearance where we need it. Uh, those are non-negotiable things in my mind. Um, we don't need to be a biomechanist, but uh, we got to have an idea how athletes move. So, you know, this is a, a great one to, uh, you know, remind you of the resources and, you know, getting on, you know, Instagram, Twitter, and, you know, uh, you know, a couple of those resources that uh, I mentioned earlier at the start, you know, figure out what they're doing for, for assessments and contact your other coaches. And uh, you, we all know how, you know, broad the coaching cat, uh, coaching community is, you know, reach out to some of your other coaches and see what they're doing with their athletes and, and what they, what they think is, uh, you know, the best way to go about things. And then, you know, following the strict 10 to one, uh, is an absolute maximum or, you know, hopefully closer to that five to one, uh, athlete coach ratio. Uh, but you know, the space, the flow, those are going to be compromised significantly if we have, you know, really anything beyond 10 to 1 athletes to coaches and then utilizing clips and, and spotting where we need to. Um, and then making the most of what you have. Ineffective training is better than potentially harmful methods. Um, you know, I'll stand by that uh, pretty confidently. Uh, I would much rather have a coach who's keeping kids active and keeping them moving, but, you know, maybe isn't putting on 20 pounds on their back squat or, you know, taking two tenths off of their 40, but they're not getting hurt. Um, and we're not searching for perfect. We're trying to find optimal. So utilizing your resources, utilizing your, your time, your budget, your space, and just making the most of what it, whatever it is. <coughs> um, you know, being strategic with your spacing and with your setup so we can maximize time. Um, you know, that, uh, that also goes for being efficient with the equipment availability, um, and using as much assistance as you can, uh, really thinking like an all hands on deck type of mentality here. <coughs> Recapping on our programming guidelines, so with our off-season, um, we're thinking uh, initially out of the gate, time to recover from the previous sports season. Um, you know, we want to first just work on, on getting getting kids back in shape, you know, back to general, you know, baseline condition and health. Uh, and then from there, uh, kind of throughout the remainder of the off-season, we're just working on everything. This, this is our go mode here. Um, so with that, you know, things we want to avoid, we really, really want to be conscious of not wasting time. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier with, uh, you know, the increase in, in, uh, you know, dark periods or, 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 you know, no contact periods, uh, becoming more common. Um, we have to really be emphatic about saturating the time that we do get. Um, so, you know, a good way to, to help facilitate that is to not just have a stagnant or, or you know, free for all training plan. Uh, you, you may not be able to know, right, uh, you know, how to write a program for shit, but if you just at least put your ideas down chronologically and, you know, kind of have an idea of how you want to navigate things, uh, it's going to create for a better product. So, um, and then, you know, we want to avoid having a constant turnover of training focus, you know, where we're, you know, doing six mile runs on Monday, we're maxing on bench press on Tuesday, and we're doing sprint work until we puke on Wednesday, and then we're going to do cleans and jumps. I mean, you know, you're, you're just going to really make everything less effective and, you know, really waste more time is what it all boils down to. So, uh, you know, be mindful there. In the preseason, again, moderate strength and volume. Our emphasis on speed and power and, and priming them for the upcoming season. It's, it's really that straightforward. Um, you know, avoid chronic overloading, um, heavy loads, high volume. And like we already touched on, you know, just don't test your athletes in preseason, please. Um, in season, you know, we're, we're doing all we can to scratch and survive 
Um, so literally, whatever you can do. Uh, it may just be recovery modalities. It may just be aerobic circuits. It may just be a, you know, once or twice a week, uh, you know, four exercise, 25 minute lift, um, literally whatever you have. But we, our goal is to mitigate physical de degradation throughout the season. Um, so on the opposite, things we want to avoid, anything that accumulates chronic fatigue, um, you know, again, we don't want to take away the, the little or dwindling energy reserves and, and physicality that we have for the games. We don't want to dwindle that down in training, right? Um, anything that's going to propagate injury risk and any high volume, high intensity loading. So in season, doing what you can doesn't need to be specific. <clears throat> and to finish out here, last, last couple slides, um, just wanted to go through a couple of examples to put them together. Uh, I do want to mention I will be putting together a subsequent handbook for this that's going to be more um, kind of plug and play or, uh, you know, more direct, hey, here's how we do this. Um, so it'll look more similar to these kinds of slides. But um, just keep an eye out for that and, and hopefully I'll have that up in a week or so. But for now, um, looking at like a baseball softball example, although frankly, you could pretty much apply this to any, any sport specifically, um, you know, we're thinking 12, 16 weeks. So October to early January GPP first couple weeks. So October time frame right now, um, strength, endurance, aerobic conditioning, hypertrophy, mixed methods, muscular strength. And notice the time length on these five weeks, five to nine and 10 to 12. So really we're looking at about half of our time, a little bit more is going to be spent right here, getting bigger and getting stronger. And again, this is early or this is our off season phase. So if we look at this collectively, 16 weeks, four weeks, so we're at 20 plus 14. So potentially upwards of 34 weeks we're really only going to get about seven of those 34 weeks or about 20% of our total time is going to be spent specifically or exclusively on getting bigger and getting stronger. So we really have to concentrate this time frame here. Um, and then coming down the stretch of the off season, <coughs> strength speed and starting to get more into our anaerobic conditioning. Remember the closer that we get to the start of the season, the closer we want to mimic the movements, and the speeds that are experienced in those sports. Preseason, starting to get into our muscular power um, and our, uh, again, you know, our anaerobic stuff. And then um, once we get down here, so basically the last two weeks before the season starts, I'm going to drop conditioning altogether. We have done it. We've, we've gotten where we need to be. Um, if, if, if we aren't in shape by this point, I can 100% guarantee you, you will not be in shape for the start of the season, no matter what you do across these three to four weeks, you will not be in the, in the appropriate shape. Um, so we should already be in shape by the time the preseason gets here. Um, so, you know, the last two weeks now, we're looking at very refined power work, moving very fast, very lightweights. And I would just replace any time that you had dedicated to conditioning, I would, I would convert it to skill work. Um, you know, and then we've already, you know, kind of covered this one pretty good. But, you know, again, in season, light strength, power and recovery modalities kind of stays the same, um, you know, and then maybe a little bit more hypertrophy towards the end here to, to try to give the uh, tendons and ligaments some love. <clears throat> and last one here, looking at a sample training split. So now we're looking back at a football example. Um, assuming we have a four day split. Uh, and assuming we have reasonable access to equipment. Um, if I were programming for a high school football team, this is pretty reflective of what it would look like. Um, you know, so we're going to break up into upper body and lower body days. We're going to have a dynamic strength day, and then we're going to have a designated conditioning day. Let me be clear on saying this. This can be done a million different ways. Um, we could go total body, and total body and then condition and condition we could go you know we can combine where we have upper body plus conditioning dynamic plus conditioning you know lower plus recovery and then you know friday another dynamic plus conditioning so you know it really just depends on what you need what you have access to but 
this being a basic example, kind of in the you know middle of the spectrum here. Um, you know, our main movers, bench press, hang clean, back squat. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, we'll assume this is an off-season period, so we're working up around 85%. Notice that the percentages change, or I'm sorry, the percentages stay the same, but the rep scheme changes just a little bit. Uh, for back squat and bench press, we're going to be at 4 by 6 For hang clean, we're going to be at 4 by 3 um, Really, 3 is kind of your marker number. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe 4 or 5. Um, for a single set of reps on like a clean or a jump or a, um, you know, if you're doing jerks, we want to keep those reps lower. Um, and then remember when we pair our, our primary mover for the day, um, we want to do something that is going to facilitate this bench press or facilitate this hang clean, facilitate this back squat. So we don't want to have a 1B of, you know, for instance here, like a, you know, max effort push up set. Um, or, a, you know, here doing like a, a, you know, 20 meter sprint, like we want to, we, if we do stuff like that, we're going to take away our ability to perform on the bench, but this is what we're getting our, our, you know, bulk of our return from here. So, you know, trying to do things that are going to help potentiate that bench press. Um, then we come down into our, you know, primary accessories. Um, so, you know, for me, it's a, a push press on an, on an upper body day, a landmine on a total day. Uh, and, you know, a rack pull or, uh, you know, we could even throw like a hex bar deadlift in here, um, you know, for our lower body day. So, again, bringing down the rep scheme a little bit, um, still working at about our 85% here. Uh, and then for here, we can pair these with things that are fatiguing and competing. You know, if we, uh, you know, can, you know, if we're doing a, a, a plate and a 25 on a landmine press, um, and that's sufficient for six reps, that's cool. If they can do a little more, great. If they do a little less, great. Um, you know, but we want to kind of have this be more of a fatiguing or exhaustive type setup. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll mention too, you notice, uh, you know, band pull apart with an isometric hold, uh, depth, uh, drop jumps with a rebound. So, you know, just adding little layers to things can kind of help to, uh, you know, overcome having a lack of equipment or a lack of time, right? You know, Doing just a, a chin up for a set of six is one thing, but if you do a, you know, three second isometric hold at the top, it's going to have a, a little bit more of a, a, a an effect. So, um, just adding little things in, and then coming down, you know, for our block three, this is our single accessories or our simple accessories. So, you know, hammer row, single arm lat pull down, band tricep, med ball throws, pal off press with arm elevation, um, some sprinter crunches. You know, common things that we all have seen and know, um, but again, don't don't get wrapped up in the exercise selection, uh, you know, as it is listed. Um, these are just kind of concepts, but, you know, for our conditioning day, we're thinking dynamic stretch movement for 10 minutes, um, some reactive, some agilities, get your nervous system going, and then we'll get into the bulk of our work. Um, you know, falling starts, 10 yards, 15 yards, three, 20 yards, and getting three rounds on each of those. Um, then coming down and doing more change of direction. Uh, so, you know, some shuttles um, and then flyers where you're, you know, increasing or decreasing your, your acceleration as you run. Um, but one last note on this. Um, well, first, uh, uh, for space purposes, I, I omitted the block one that we talked about earlier. But, um, you know, with conditioning work, I think that it is almost essential to have this be like a, com a competition almost every time. It is really tough to get people to motivate, get people motivated to condition. Um, it's even tougher when you're talking about 15 year old kids at six in the morning. So, um, utilizing a resource in the fact that you have a lot of bodies around, um, you know, have have conditioning work be partnered. Um, it's going to drive the competition factor, and it's in ultimately it's going to drive the the investment on the return. So, um, when we're thinking about like speed work or agility, even um, those are technical. So for those, I would advise against, you know, doing partner work or, or competition work, um, because we want to try to emphasize refining the skill when we're conditioning, it's not a technical thing. It's a capacity thing. So, um, you know, a part, a partner setup can, can really do a lot for you. That is about it. Um, I actually got that in in under 90 minutes. So I'm pretty pumped about that. I apologize for the heavy text on these uh, slides, this one, but um, you know, again, there's a lot of basic information that I wanted to cover. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, and you know, uh, this goes for anything that I post, but especially here, 
Um, if there's any questions on this, please feel free to reach out privately or, or, or drop me a comment. Um, I'd be happy to go through a more specific example or, or setup for you if uh, you know we can kind of talk about what you have and, and how to utilize it. But uh, really, I'm an open book with this, so um, please feel free to reach out. But uh, other than that, that is about all I have for you today. So uh, you know, please be smart, be safe, stay inside, uh, stay away from people. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll have another one of these up next weekend.